Now, I'm not a big history guy. I never enjoyed a lot of history classes in school. I have a hard time with very chronological history books, but I do love and really enjoy the history of things, especially when those things are significantly more impactful than you might have expected. So this book, Salt, by Mark Kurlansky, was recommended to me by a number of people because it is such a great book in that sense. It, this is a whole book about salt, <laughs> and that might seem kind of strange. Who wants to read a book about salt? And the answer is you do. <laughs> I was blown away by how good this book is and how big of an impact salt has had on the world that I just didn't realize. There's actually something kind of magical about that because when you read a book like this or listen to this podcast, maybe you'll you'll get a new appreciation for something that you interact with every day. Every piece of food that you eat probably has some salt added to it, or at least has some salt in it. I assume that you have salt at home. You might have some salt in view of you right now, but how often have you actually taken the time to think about or look at how impactful salt has been on the world throughout all of history? Because the answer is quite a bit. Before we dive in, if you haven't checked out Readwise, that's readwise.io slash nat, you should. Last week, I talked about how I use Readwise to pull all of my annotations out of my books automatically, even the physical ones. I just take a picture, boop, it scans them, it saves them to my Readwise account, which I can then export to my Notion and everything. The other great thing about Readwise is their reader tool. If you use Pocket or Instapaper or anything else to read articles, Readwise basically has a much better version of that for people who want to annotate what they're reading, organize it, be able to find it again later. Anytime I'm reading articles, I'm using the Readwise Reader. It's fantastic. It's included with that membership that automatically pulls all of your highlights out from everywhere that you read. And you can try that out at readwise.io slash nat. And thank you to everybody who checked out Readwise after hearing about it on the podcast, heard great feedback from a bunch of people. Like I said, I use it basically every day, so I'm really excited that they are sponsoring the show. All right, let's learn about salt. Now, why even write a book about salt? Well, you probably know that if you don't get enough salt, you die. And this isn't usually a big consideration for people anymore, but it was a pretty meaningful consideration for a lot of history. It turns out that when you're on a more hunter-gatherer diet, you're eating a little bit more red meat, maybe some organs, you actually get enough salt from your food that you don't necessarily need to supplement it. But once we transitioned to agriculture and started eating more farmed food, our diets shifted just enough that we needed to supplement with salt in order to survive. So you really couldn't have an agricultural society without salt. Now, the effects of salt deficiency are, are quite interesting. I'm going to read you a little passage from the book here. A victim of starvation experiences hunger, and so the need for food is apparent. Salt deficiency causes headaches and weakness, then lightheadedness, then nausea. If deprived long enough, the victim will die. But at no point in this process is a craving for salt experienced. However, most people choose to eat far more salt than they need, and perhaps this urge, the simple fact that we like the taste of salt, is a natural defense. So I, I think this is just fascinating. If we don't get enough salt, we die, kind of like a lot of other vitamins and nutrients, but it, it happens a lot quicker. Earlier, a little bit earlier, they talk about how the, the two essential pieces of salt are sodium and chloride. They're explosive or toxic on their own, but we do kind of, or I guess chlorine is toxic on its own, but we do kind of need both of them. Chloride is essential for digestion and in respiration. Without sodium, which the body cannot manufacture, the body would be unable to transport nutrients or oxygen, transmit nerve pulses, or even move muscles, including the heart. So if you don't get salt, you die. But we don't have this experience of salt deficiency. If you've ever gone a few days without eating, you know, doing a little bit of a fast, or gone a number of hours without drinking water, you will feel that craving for food and water. But if we don't eat salt, we don't get like an extra salt craving. We don't start thinking, oh, I need salt, I need salt, I need salt. But we do have this natural desire for it. And that might counteract that lack of a experience of deficiency. The thing that I think is really interesting about the symptoms of salt deficiency and our unnatural reaction to it is that a lot of people actually find they feel much better day to day if they add a little bit of extra salt to their diet. So we needed salt to stay alive, but that wasn't the only reason that we wanted salt, even though that seems like it would be good enough because salt was also the only way that we could preserve 
food. Until refrigeration, the main way that you preserved things was by pickling or salting. You can take basically any vegetable, put it in a jar, submerge it in water, add about 2% of its weight in salt, shake it up, leave it on the counter, just like lightly ajar so that some air bubbles can escape. And within a week or two, it's gonna ferment and you're going to have pickled vegetables. The cool thing about that is that you can then seal that or leave it only partially sealed and it can last for months, even a year. So we transitioned to agriculture. We didn't have the same steady daily source of food from what we were going out and hunter, hunting, <laughs> hunting, going out and hunting and gathering. We just had what we harvested and you might harvest all of this food and you're not gonna eat it in the next few days before it goes bad. You needed to preserve it. And the only way that we had to preserve it was salt. That's And that's kind of amazing, right? <laughs> like we figured out that we could just put our extra harvest into jars and almost like any type of jars. They used clay, they used eventually glass, and you could just seal it with some salt and water, make sure it was submerged, and then what might spoil in a few days suddenly lasts for months. That's incredible, but you need salt to do it. And the same thing with salted fish and meat. We figured out that if you kind of like cake the fish or cake the meat in salt, keep it at a low enough temperature, what happens is the salt gets pulled into the meat and in doing so, it ends up expelling most of the water and it removes most of the chance for bacteria to grow because the bacteria need some of that water in the meat for them to thrive and grow. And so if you properly salt the meat or the fish, it won't spoil. Now suddenly, if you harvest a pig or harvest a cow, it can last for months when it's properly salted, whereas before that, you'd have to basically eat whatever you killed within a day or two. So salt not only keeps us alive, it keeps everything else fresh that we need to stay alive. We don't just need the salt to live, we need the salt for everything else that we need to live once we switch to agriculture. That's why it became this absolute cornerstone of society. It's why it became so influential in determining how societies were built and developed. It even ends up getting embedded in a lot of sacred and fertility rites. I'll share a couple of little stories from the book just because I, I thought these were so, so fun. So the author is, is referencing Ernest Jones, who was a friend of Sigmund Freud, and he was kind of studying salt. And he says, in all ages, salt has been invested with a significance far exceeding that inherent in its natural properties. Homer calls it a divine substance. Plato describes it as especially dear to the gods. And we shall presently note the importance attached to it in religious ceremonies, covenants, and magical charms. That this should have been so in all parts of the world and in all times shows that we are dealing with a general human tendency and not with any local custom, circumstance, or notion. The Romans, Jones pointed out, called a man in love salax, salix, in a salted state, which is the origin of the word salacious. In the Pyrenees, bridal couples went to church with salt in their left pockets to guard against impotence. And this idea of salt and fertility being linked, it comes up throughout like basically all of history. In some parts of France, only the groom carried salt, in others, only the bride. In Germany, the bride's shoes were sprinkled with salt. Celibate Egyptian priests abstained from salt because it excited sexual desire. In Borneo, when Dayak tribesmen returned from taking heads, the abstinence from both sex and salt was required. When Apima killed an Apache, both he and his wife abstained from sex and salt for three weeks. And he's got a bunch more examples, right? So salt was so essential, so important to society that it was linked tightly with fertility, with sex, with reproduction. It was a big deal. And we're gonna spend some time digging into how salt shaped some of these really big cultures. I don't have time for like all the examples in the book, but I pulled some of my favorites. But before we get to them, I just want to share a little bit about how it impacted some of these big three early areas. So we've got China, we have Egypt, and we have Rome. Now, the Chinese realized very early on, obviously, the need to salt is one of the earliest agricultural societies. And so they found a couple of great ways to get more salt in their diet. The first was to create sauces by fermenting fish in them. So you've probably heard of fish sauce. Well, because fish naturally have a certain amount of salt in them, it was easier to get salt from fish than from uh, like a mine or from evaporating water, or any of the more arduous processes when you had access to enough fish to do this. So fish sauce was actually in part a way to get more salt into their food and fish sauce became very popular. Eventually, 
they started fermenting their fish sauce with some soybeans as well. They mixed in some soybeans, it added additional nutrient and, and helps the fermentation process. And then eventually they basically just took the fish out and they could add a little bit of salt, add the soybeans and it would create soy sauce. And part of the reason that soy caught on as a way to create this salted sauce to get more salt into their diet was that, and I didn't know this before reading, but soy is apparently a really beneficial plant for the soil when, when it's planted properly. Like commercial soybean farming in the US is really awful for the land, but when it's done traditionally, apparently it, it can be very beneficial. And so they must have figured this out in some way. Soy puts nutrients back into the soil and can restore fields that have been exhausted by other crops. The bean is so nutritious that a person could be sustained for a considerable period on nothing but water, soy, and salt. So it was, it was kind of this miracle food, and it's part of how it found its way into soy sauce, which became such a staple in their cuisine. So then the Egyptians, too, were among the first to figure out the importance of salt and also the power of salting. And Kurlansky talks about in the book that we think of ancient civilizations as being built near the water because obviously you need fresh water, you might want access to waterways, but another really important reason they were all built near the ocean was because that's where the salt was. And for Egypt, building along the Nile, it was not only a source of uh, life and vegetation and everything compared to the rest of the desert, it was also one of the easiest places to harvest salt. And so he says, the Egyptians mixed brine with vinegar and used it as a sauce known as oxalme, which was later used by the Romans. Like the Sichuan Chinese, the Egyptians had an appreciation for vegetables preserved in brine or salt. And he lists off some of the things found in a, an Egyptian tomb from before 2000 BC. So it included quail, stewed pigeon, fish, ribs of beef, kidneys, barley porridge, wheat bread, stewed figs, berries, cheese, wine, and beer. And a lot of those items would be salted, and there would also often be some form of wooden container holding table salt. And if you still use a salt shaker, I highly recommend picking up a salt cellar. It's basically like a little bowl that you can have on your table to put salt in, and then you can just pinch it out with your fingers. Bacteria and stuff can't really grow in salt, so it's not gross if everybody's touching it. And it's way easier to salt your food by just like reaching in and grabbing some. And the, and the salt cellars are gonna come back as a theme throughout the book, but pharaohs would be buried with them. That's how important salt was in the culture. Egyptians may have also been the first to cure meat and fish with salt. The earliest Chinese record of preserving fish and salt dates back from around 2000 BC. Salted fish and birds have been found in Egyptian tombs from considerably earlier. And then he explains a little bit about what I was just saying about how curing flesh and salt absorbs the moisture in which the bacteria grow. But there's also this other cool effect of salting meat that <clears throat> proteins unwind when exposed to heat and they do the same when exposed to salt. So salting actually has a similar effect to cooking. And one of the magical things about humans is that we kind of evolved alongside cooking. So our body can get a lot more nutrients out of foods through cooking them. We can have a much more efficient digestive system. That's part of how supposedly our brains were able to become so much larger than other animals. And cooking was part of how we unlocked that. And it turns out salting does a lot of the same thing. So that's why it's a little bit easier to process a salted meat like prosciutto than it would be to process raw pork. The salting has actually done some of that digestive work for you the way cooking does. Salt also ended up shaping early trade routes. So the Egyptians did not export great quantities of salt, but exported considerable amounts of salted food, especially fish to the Middle East. Trade in salted food would shape economies for the next four millennia. It's a theme we're gonna come back to a lot. And there's this one story here about this early Middle Eastern African trade in salt, which is wild. Because a profitable salt shipment is bulky and heavy, accessible transportation has always been the essential ingredient in salt trade. But in most of Asia, Europe, and the Americas, waterways have been the solution. But in the African continent, where a wealth of salt was located in the wadis and dry lake beds of the waterless Sahara, another solution was found, the camel. And camels are, were just this magical animal in Africa because they could take these long journeys. They could go over this very uneven, uncomfortable terrain that horses and ox and other animals couldn't handle as well. And they were much more resistant to the heat because they could retain so much water. So listen to this. By the Middle Ages, caravans of 40,000 camels carried salt from Taudeni to Timbuktu, a 435-mile journey taking as long as one month. So that's not 40,000 separate people trading. Those are 
individual caravans containing 40,000 camels carrying salt and other goods across the desert. I would love to see a picture of that, or it, I mean, maybe that's something we can make in mid-journey or something. What would that look like? I mean, you basically have a small village doing it at that point. That's just such a wild thing to imagine. And salt was one of the first things that we traded that established these trade routes. And then came gold, kola nut, leather, cotton, all of these other products started coming along with them. And then we get to Rome. And Rome is where things really, really start to take off around salt as an industry. Because the, the Egyptians were harvesting enough to, because the Egyptians and the Chinese were harvesting enough to take care of themselves you know, for doing some basic trade. And Rome really starts to turn it into this big business. Kolansky says, the first of the great Roman roads, the Via Salaria, the salt road, was built to bring salt not only to Rome, but across the interior of the peninsula. Their, their military needed salt, especially with the marching. All day you're losing a lot of it from sweat. And so armies actually needed a constant supply of salt. Is another theme that's going to come up a lot in the book. And so you needed a way to get salt to your military. And so Rome was partially building these roads just so that they could control their empire with their army, which needed salt and other goods. The Roman army required salt for its soldiers and for its horses and livestock. At times, soldiers were even paid in salt, which was the origin of the word salary and the expression worth his salt or earning his salt. In fact, the Latin word sol became the French word sold, meaning pay, which is the origin of the word soldier. So you can see how salt is like working its way into society here. But but beyond shaping trade routes and infrastructure, salt also laid the foundation for a lot of early taxation systems. So the Chinese were some of the first to implement a salt tax as a way to charge citizenry and to raise revenues for the government. And then during the Punic Wars, a centrally long struggle to the death for control of the Mediterranean with the Phoenician colony of Carthage, Rome manipulated salt prices to raise money for the war. The Roman government declared an artificially high price for salt and put the profits at the disposal of the military. And the salt tax is another theme that is going to come up over and over again for the next 2,000 years, really until the last couple of hundred. And so Rome is building all this infrastructure, they're building roads, they're building these salt mills along the Mediterranean, and then eventually it collapses. And for a long time, there is no dominant player in the Mediterranean in salt until we get to Venice. It's early in Venetian society, they're doing the same thing that so many other people have done. They have to create these kind of like pools to trap seawater and then try to evaporate it. And they're pulling the salt out that way. It was this arduous process, but shipbuilding is getting better. The Mediterranean's opening up, travel is expanding and trade routes are expanding. And eventually, some clever people in Venice realize that they can actually make more money simply trading salt than trying to harvest it themselves. So I'll read you from the book. Beginning in 1281, the government paid merchants a subsidy on salt landed in Venice from other areas. As a result, shipping salt to Venice became so profitable that the same merchants could afford to ship other goods at prices that undersold their competitors. Growing fat off the salt subsidy, Venice merchants could afford to send ships to the eastern Mediterranean, where they picked up valuable cargoes of Indian spices and sold them in Western Europe at low prices that their non-Venetian competitors could not offer. He goes on, that meant that the Venetian public was paying extremely high prices for salt, but they did not mind expensive salt if they could dominate the spice trade and be leaders in the grain trade. And the Venetian government has this kind of altruistic mercantilism going on where it says, when grain harvests failed in Italy, the Venetian government would use its salt income to subsidize grain imports from other parts of the Mediterranean and thereby corner the Italian grain market. Unlike the Chinese salt monopoly, the Venetian government never owned salt, but simply took a profit from regulating its trade. Enriched by its share of sales on high-priced salt, the salt administration could offer loans to finance other trade. Between the 14th and 16th centuries, a period when Venice was a leading port for grain and spices, between 30 and 50% of the tonnage of imports to Venice was in salt. So if you've ever heard or thought of Venice as this incredible like tradesman mercantilist society, that all happened because of the salt trade. The salt administration also maintained Venice's palatial public buildings and the complex hydraulic system that prevented the metropolis from washing away. 
The grand and cherished look of Venice, many of its statues and ornaments were financed by the Salt administration. And then they start to figure out that they can actually start to exert some military and political control through their control over the salt trade. In 1250, when Venice agreed to supply Mantua and Ferrara with salt, the contract stipulated that these cities would not buy salt from anyone else. And this became the model for Venice salt contracts. So now they're starting to realize, okay, we can, we can sell salt at a great price to these other areas, along with all of these other goods, because we've established these incredible trade routes. We have so much control over the market that we can force them to sign exclusivity deals where they only buy salt from us. And if they're already buying all their salt from Venice, they're probably just gonna buy other things too because they're coming on the same ships, right? So then Venice realizes that it needs to control more of the salt trade. Merchants financed by the Salt Administration went farther into the Mediterranean, buying salt from Alexandria, Egypt to Algeria, to the Crimean Peninsula in the, peninsula in the Black Sea, to Sardinia, Ibiza, Crete, and Cyprus. Wherever they went, they tried to dominate the supply, control the salt works, even acquire it if they could. And then they start to get more aggressive. Venice manipulated markets by controlling production. In the late 13th century, wishing to raise the world market price, Venice had all salt works in Crete destroyed and banned the local production of salt. And then whenever the Cretans start to run out of salt, they have to like ship it in from other places to keep what's almost like a slave state in, in some ways alive. And they've been able to take over this area by controlling the flow of salt. So Venice amasses all of this power and it has it for hundreds of years. And it basically continues until the Mediterranean stops being the dominant body of water in world trade. Because starting in 1250, Genoa also started getting into the salt trade and the conflict with Venice started increasing and increasing. And then their salt competition eventually led to a war. So when it led to a war in 1378 to 80, known as the War of Chiogia, I'm sorry, I'm gonna mispronounce a lot of things today, I think. Venice's ability to convert its commercial fleet into warships proved decisive. Venice defeated Genoa, its only major competitor for commercial dominance of the Mediterranean. But what actually ended up undoing Venice's power was something completely unrelated. It was the transition from the Mediterranean being the dominant trading body of water in the world to the Atlantic. So the beginning of the end came in 1488 when the Portuguese captain Bartholomew Diaz rounded Africa's Cape of Good Hope. In 1492, Columbus, in search of another route to India, in the opposite direction, began a series of voyages for Spain, which opened up transatlantic trade carrying new and valuable spices. Then in 1497, Caboto, the Genoese turned Venetian, sailed for England as John Cabot, again looking for a route to India, and told the world about North America and its wealth of codfish. So not only were Atlantic ports now needed for trade with the newly found lands, but the Portuguese had opened the way from Atlantic ports to the Indian Ocean and the spice producers. Now the Atlantic, and not the Mediterranean, was the most important body of water for trade. And he goes on to say that Genoa and Spain, they sort of acknowledged this, they embraced it, they transitioned everything to trading in the, Medi <clears throat> to trading in the Atlantic. Ven Venice resisted it, tried to maintain their grip over the Mediterranean, hold on to that being their dominant source of power, and they eventually faded away. So that was kind of this Mediterranean era of salt. It, it let Venice become this incredibly dominant power for 200 years. And that only change, nobody, people couldn't overthrow them. <laughs> they were winning these wars with their navy that was based on their salt trade. It was wild. And the thing that stopped it was discovering North America starting the Atlantic trade. There was one other group that was very powerful in this period though that wasn't trading in the Mediterranean and that was the the northern fish trade. So the British, the French, a lot of Europe needed basically two things. They needed salt which they were getting from the Venetians and then they also needed fish right because fish was one of the easier foods to salt. It could be stored on ships, could be carried for long periods. It could be transported over land, and it was a great way to feed your armies. Whenever they were preparing to go to war, two of the things they would start collecting were fish to be salted and the salt that they needed to prep the fish. So they're doing all this trade with Venice, but they're also doing all this trade with Sweden and the northern countries. Because apparently these northern countries actually had the most abundant supply of fish, but they didn't have an abundant supply of salt, which created this big problem. 
The shortage of salt in the north was frustrating because of all the world's oceans, the cold subarctic seas have the densest schools and the greatest variety of species. And so they have all of this fish, but they can't salt enough of it to ship it to England and other places. Sweden actually tried to buy an island to fix this. Sweden hopes to acquire an island in the Caribbean from which to produce salt, but when it finally got one, St. Bartholomew, the amount of salt produced and shipped back to Sweden was barely enough to cure the quantity of herring destined for the island as slave food. So they, <laughs> they, they actually go through the process of buying an island in the Caribbean and they can't get enough salt on it onto a ship back to Sweden to even cover the cost of the shipment. Which, I mean, <laughs> what an unfortunate purchase. So the salt shortage of the northern fisheries was solved by a commercial group that organized both herring and salt trades. Between 1250 and 1350, the same time that Venice is coming into dominance in the Mediterranean, a group of small associations in northern German cities formed, known as the Hanseatic League from the Middle High German word Hans, meaning fellowship, these associations pooled their resources to form more powerful groups to act in their commercial interest. They stopped piracy in the Baltic, initiated quality control on traded items, established commercial laws, provided reliable nautical charts, and built lighthouses and other aids of navigation. So these are basically a, a group of tradesmen, fishermen, form this league starting in Germany, and they decide that they are going to try to gain more influence in the Northern Seas, especially via trade. And it doesn't start out as a salt thing, but it very quickly gets there. Because by the 14th century, the Hanseatics controlled the mouths of all the northerly flowing rivers of Central Europe, from the Rhine to the Vistula. They had organizations in Iceland, in London, and as far south as Ukraine and even in Venice. In the early 14th century, the Hanseatics, realizing the low prices and light tax on Portuguese salt, more than made up for the cost of transporting it a longer distance, imported Setubal white salt to trade in the Danish and Dutch fisheries. So then in the 14th and 15th centuries, these areas in southern Sweden became major herring producers and they imported salt from the Hanseatic Germans. And these guys were basically able to start controlling all of the trade in that region. At the height of their power in the 15th century, the Hanseatics were believed to have had at their command 40,000 vessels and 300,000 men. And for a while, they were these honorable, respectable merchants, but it quickly turned sour. They were soon seen as ruthless aggressors who wanted to monopolize all economic activity, and the merchant class rebelled against them. And here comes another theme. The Danes went to war with this merchant group over control of herring and lost. So <laughs> this merchant cartel fights the Danes and defeats them. They're trying to fight for, for control over the herring supply, right? And this is the other thing that's tied in with salt is fish because again, fish were a very easy thing to salt, very easy to transport. Once it was salted, great source of food for armies, villagers, anyone. And so you really wanted both. You wanted a fish supply and you wanted a salt supply. And that's what the Danes are fighting over here. By 1403, when the Hanseatic League gained complete control of Bergen, Norway, it had achieved a monopoly on Northern European production of herring and salt. And it was just constantly at war with these other Baltic states. In 1406, the Hanseatics caught 96 British fishermen off Bergen, tied their hands and feet, and threw them overboard. So if they found you fishing in their waters, they would drown you. I mean, this is literally like a drug cartel, but it's, <laughs> it's herring and salt, right? And again, this just continues for hundreds of years, and they only lose their power when in 1652, the British Navy destroyed their whole herring fleet. And then eventually the Dutch had to make peace with the British, mull things over, and there was this kind of, there was this bit of a vacuum as we get into the 1500s, 1600s of power, both around salt and around fish. And that's going to lead to this next really big civilization theme, which is salt and the Americas. Now, salt and the Americas is the big one because we've just talked about how Venice had this control over the Mediterranean, the Hanseatic League had this control over the North. Those are the two big dominant trading areas for a lot of you know, really European and Western history. And then the Atlantic opens up and you've got ships that are going to North America, South America, and explorers are realizing that not only are there an incredible amount of fish here, but there's this incredible demand for salt because they're, they're finding so much fish that they can't even get all of it back. It's a similar problem to Sweden because they don't have the salt that they need, but there are supplies of salt 
in North America, and they just have to figure out how to like tie everything together. So Karlansky goes so far as to say that the history of the Americas is one of constant warfare over salt. Whoever controlled salt was in power. This was true before the Europeans arrived, and it continued to be the reality until after the American Civil War. So even where cities are based it is partially influenced by salt. I talked about how there's really this, this dual factor. It's not just where there's water, it's where there's also salt. He says, a map reader could reasonably assume that towns were placed and interconnected haphazardly without any scheme or design. That is because the roads are simply widened footpaths and trails. And these trails were originally cut by animals looking for salt. Animals get the salt they need by finding brine springs, brackish water, rock salt, any natural salt available for licking. These salt licks found throughout the continent were often a flat area of several acres of barren whitish brown or whitish gray earth. Deep holes, almost caves, were formed by the constant licking. The lick at the end of the road, because it had a salty supply, was a suitable place for a settlement. Villages were built at the licks. A salt lick near Lake Erie had a wide road made by Buffalo, and the town started there was named Buffalo, New York. So Karlansky says, as on the Italian peninsula, all the great centers of civilization on the American continents were founded in places with access to salt. The Incans were salt producers, with salt wells just outside Cusco. In Colombia, nomadic tribesmen probably first built permanent settlements because they needed salt and learned how to make it. Their society was organized around natural brine springs. The Chibcha, a highland tribe living in the area that was to become the modern capital of Bogota, became a dominant group because they were the best salt makers. In yet another example of the association between sex and salt for 20th century psychologists to ponder, the Chibcha salt lords honored the gods two times a year by abstaining from sex and salt. We have similar stories here of civilizations controlling salt to control each other. The Aztecs controlled the salt routes by military power and were able to deny their enemies access to salt. William Prescott's 1819 classic, History of the Conquest of Mexico, described the Aztecs receiving tribute from their subjects. 2,000 loaves of very white salt, refined in the shape of a mold for the consumption only of the lords of Mexico. The Spanish took power by taking over the salt works of the indigenous people they conquered. Cortes, who came from southern Spain, not far from both Spanish and Portuguese salt works, understood the power and politics of salt. And it goes on and talks about how the Mayans had salt works going back to 1000 BC and argues that some of the, the Mexican or some of the Mayan civilizations rose to power by controlling salt production and prospered on the ability to trade salt, flourishing in spite of constant warfare over salt sources. So even before explorers showed up in North and South America. Salt was this hugely important resource. And then the British start arriving and they realize there's this kind of magical combination in North America. The British first arrived in North America in the north at Newfoundland and they took cod. They next arrived in the south of the Caribbean where they took salt, which they needed for the cod. Only after they had a significant population of colonists in between did they think of America as a market in which to sell Liverpool salt. So again, remember, fish were super important, great source of food. Salt was really important for salting the fish. The British figured out that they could fish in Newfoundland, harvest salt in the Caribbean, salt their fish, and then ship it all back to Europe and sell it there, and then eventually sell it in the Americas. Now, I didn't know this before reading this book, but in the Caribbean, the leading cargo carried to North America, more tonnage than even sugar, molasses, or rum, was salt. The leading return cargo from North America to the Caribbean was salt cod, used to feed slaves on sugar plantations. So I didn't talk about this too much, but this was one of the main ways of harvesting salt, was to find areas on the ocean where salt water would wash in and then get kind of stuck and you could evaporate it and harvest the salt crystals. And the Caribbean turned out to be great for this. And since Columbus and his Spanish successors had already annihilated the indigenous population, these scarcely inhabited islands were easily converted into salt centers. I always thought about the Caribbean as like sugar and other things, but it, it was really salt. Salt was the dominant value that the Caribbean brought to these early colonists and explorers. But even that wasn't enough because they were harvesting so much fish, they just couldn't get enough salt to cure all of it. And so the Dutch gave incentives to colonists and in 1660 granted a colonist the right to build salt works on a small island near New Amsterdam. That island was called Coney Island. And some of you may know that New Amsterdam eventually became New York. 
So Coney Island was one of the first salt works in America because we just couldn't get enough salt for all the fish that we were catching. And so production keeps ramping up. We keep catching more fish. We keep trying to produce as much salt as possible. And eventually the Americas become so prolific at producing salted cod that the British can't even sell it fast enough. The American colonists produced more, especially more salt cod than the British could sell. As long as the Americans were making their products with British salt, the British were happy to let them overproduce. But the British often failed to supply enough salt for American needs. And so then the American colonies, especially the two most productive, Virginia and Massachusetts, became accustomed to selling their products around the Atlantic world. By the early 1700s, Boston merchants did not feel that they needed England anymore. Now this was a core part of how colonism worked and this, or colonialism worked, was British would control the salt trade and they would supply all the salt to the Americas. But America started producing more of its own salt and the British couldn't supply it fast enough for what America needed. And this is where you start to get this feeling of, hey, maybe we don't need you anymore. Maybe we can actually be independent. And it starts to put some of this, these ideas of revolution. And so that sense of revolution starts growing and growing. And then eventually in the summer of 1775, the British declared the colonies in open rebellion and responded with a naval blockade, causing an immediate and serious salt shortage, not only for the fisheries, but for the soldiers, horses, and medical supplies of George Washington's Continental Army. In addition to the blockade, British ground forces isolated the mid-Atlantic colonies from their two sources of American salt, New England and the South. They even attacked and destroyed mid-Atlantic salt works. So this was a very common strategy, kind of like we talked about with the Venetians controlling the Mediterranean and what Cortez did when he landed in South America. If you can control the salt works, if you can manage the supply of salt to an area, it's very hard for them to fight you and it's very easy for you to control them. So that's what the British try to do here. And then Americans have to get more innovative and figure out, okay, how are we going to get salt? Because without it, we can't really do anything. And we eventually figure out that we can do things like produce bay salt in places like Cape Cod and these new innovative ways of creating salt are part of what allow America to truly get off of British dependence, fund its military and its population and successfully revolt and establish an independent nation. So after all this goes on in America, basically the same thing happens in France. And I'm not going to touch on it too long because it, it's, I mean, it's so similar of a story, but salt or France had a salt tax, like when we talked about before, like the British tried to do in America, like, like it's recurred throughout history. And it started off as kind of evenly applying to everyone and it slowly gets more and more in even, uneven. And there's eventually six zones in France with completely different salt prices. And so in 1784, a minnow of salt, which was 49 kilograms, cost only 31 sous in Brittany, but 81 in Poteau, 591 in Anjou, and 611 in Berry. So you've got a 20x price difference in salt in different areas of France, and two of those areas are right next to each other. The most important smuggling border in France was the Loire River, which marked the line between the Pays Exempt and the Pays de Grand Gabel, between Brittany and Anjou, regions where Necker had found the price of salt to be 31 sous and 591 sous, respectively. You have a 20x difference in salt between these two areas, and they're like just across the river from each other. So obviously smugglers are going to carry salt back and forth between them to try to make money. And it's another situation where the, small, <laughs> where the salt smuggling gets so big that France basically has to go to like war with these smugglers. Something close to a state of permanent warfare developed between salt smugglers and the Gabalou. Gabalou were the salt tax collectors in France. They would be murdered and the crown would respond by having royal troops sack the village where the crime took place. On September 8, 1710, the Gabalou went heavily armed into the woods near Avignon to intercept salt smugglers and 40 or 50 salt traders opened fire on them. The area was in open rebellion and similar rebellions were breaking out all over France. So again, Salt is helping spark these greater political revolutions. And I, I'm just not gonna have time to touch on it, but a lot of the same story plays out in India as well. So you have the American Revolution and the French Revolution, but the story of salt in the Americas is not over because during the Civil War, salt becomes really important again. So Kralansky says, the lack of an arms industry was not the only strategic shortcoming of the South. It also did not make enough salt. In 1858, the principal salt states of the South, Virginia, Kentucky, Florida, and Texas, produced about 2 million bushels of salt, while New York, Ohio, and Pennsylvania produced 12 million bushels. 
So the North had 6x the salt production. And so as soon as the war starts, the South becomes basically salt starved. At the outbreak of war, a 200 pound sack of Liverpool salt sold at the pier in New Orleans for 50 cents. After more than a year of the blockade in the fall of 1862, $6 a sack was considered a bargain. By January 1863, the price in Savannah, a major port until the blockade, was $25 for a sack. So in the span of about three years, the price goes from 50 cents to $25, because as soon as the war starts, again, the same theme, the North sends a bunch of ships down south and tries to prevent any more salt from getting there. They, they block off their trade. And obviously they're blocking off a lot of other things too, but they're really able to control the salt supply. Lincoln even sends warships down to Florida to bomb the salt works from the coast. Like it's not bomb, to cannon the salt works from the coast to destroy them to try to further hinder the salt's ability to produce salt. And it works. That's a 50x increase in the price of salt in three years. And as Union forces march into the South and engage in these different areas, they're destroying the salt works as they go. And so it's one of the main things that they look for. And it says, they were attacking salt works in Darien, Georgia, Back Bay, Virginia, Bear Inlet, North Carolina, Gooseneck, Florida, Masonboro Inlet, North Carolina, Cane Patch, South Carolina, Tampa, Florida, just all over. They're just marching all over the South trying to destroy their salt production because again, it's a really great way to control people. All right, so I, I, you know, I, I think you guys get this idea, there's more stories, you know, India, obviously, another big one, but there's two more cool things from here that I want to share. The first is the impact salt had on energy. And this is kind of a quick one, but basically the first drills were actually invented to get brackish water because in ancient China in particular, they realized that if you could get at the brackish water underground, you could evaporate it and pull the salt out. And that was a good source of salt when you were more inland. So they started creating drills to drill down and harvest this brackish water. But then some of those wells started exploding. And what it turned out was happening was that they were drilling down and finding natural gas. And, you know, they had no idea what was going on. So they thought it was evil spirits, right? But eventually somebody said, well, hey, what if we just like try setting that on fire? And they did. And then they started putting their pots near it and cooking with it. And this was, this was a long time ago, thousands of years ago. Yeah, 250 BC, they started discovering this. And then by AD 100, they were basically building bamboo piping to bring the natural gas up into their home so they could cook with it. So 2000 years ago, they had natural gas infrastructure for cooking with in their homes, wild. And that was kind of the main contribution of salt to energy for a long time until we start drilling for oil. And then we realize that a lot of places where there are these big salt licks and big salt reserves, there's also oil. So he says, because salt is impenetrable, organic material gets trapped next to the salt and slowly decomposes into oil and gas. For this reason, oil, gas, or both are frequently found on the edge of salt, which is why they were accidentally finding gas when they were drilling for salt. And so people start looking in these very salty areas for oil. And it says, in 1908, oil was found in Persia, now Iran, in the places where Herodotus, the like ancient historian, had written about salt. So it creates this kind of like cool recurrence where it was how we discovered energy originally. It created the drilling technology because a lot of, eventually drills got much more complex, but for a couple thousand years, drills didn't change that much. And they were how we got out water, how we dug wells, how we found this natural gas. And they basically create the oil industry because we can use the known existence of salt to find locations for oil. But then eventually salt goes on the decline. So a few things lead to salt becoming less important and why it's such a smaller consideration in our lives today. The first is canning. So once we could can food, we didn't need to salt it anymore. And so the need to ferment everything to salt all of our fish and meat went down significantly. The second big thing was refrigeration. We started to figure out refrigeration in the late 1800s, early 1900s. And once you could refrigerate food, you didn't need to salt it to preserve it either. So between those two things, you, you had canning for long-term storage, refrigeration for short-term storage. The daily needs of salt to preserve all of our food went down significantly, which, which is why we don't think of it as nearly as important today. Fermenting is something that's kind of like fun and cool that you do if you're into it, not something that you have to do to stay alive, right? That's a big change to happen in 200 years. And then the last thing I'll talk about is just this, this question of health, right? Because this is still a topic today. 
The argument has been continuing since ancient times between those who think salt is healthy and those who think it is unhealthy. They both may be right. Unarguably, the body needs salt. A great deal of research indicates a relationship between high blood pressure and cardiovascular problems and eating large quantities of salt. And this is fascinating. The Yellow Emperor's Classic of Internal Medicine, a Chinese book from the 1st or 2nd century AD, warned that salt can cause high blood pressure, which can lead to strokes. Like, how do they know that? <laughs> and not, not coincidentally, one of the fatal symptoms of salt deficiency is low blood pressure. But there are also studies that refute a link between high salt intake and high blood pressure. Some studies even indicate that low salt diets are unhealthy. The kidneys store excess sodium, and in theory, someone with healthy kidneys could eat excessive salt with impunity. Sweating and urination, by design, relieve the body of salt excesses. The problem lies in the balance of sodium and potassium, but it seems that an imbalance cannot be adjusted simply by eating more or less potassium-rich vegetables versus sodium-rich salt. So this debate has basically been going on for thousands of years, and we still don't totally know the answer to it. I've sort of always been in the camp that if you're eating high quality salt in healthy ways, so like salting your meat or vegetables versus having a McDonald's hamburger. I don't really see what would be wrong with that, especially since you need it. And as long as you're sweating and getting that salt back out of your system, it's probably much worse if you're sedentary and inactive and not letting your body expel all the excess salt it doesn't need. That seems like that would be the bigger problem than the salt consumption itself, but it's still kind of an open question. So anyway, I found this book absolutely fascinating. I really, really flew through it. I think you could tell from the excitement talking about it. And it was a fun way to learn a little bit of world history about Venice, the Americas, the Hanseatic League. It, it was really, really a fun read. If you enjoyed this, I'm releasing one of these each week along with other videos. Please subscribe to make sure that you get them. And I'll be really excited to share another book with you next week.